helps. Maybe a little bit. Not so much, yeah. Telephones have better cameras, right? Than old Macs. This is like a 213 Mac. Well, we could do high definition. Welcome everyone. We're gonna talk about pure devotees that don't look like pure devotees. Is that okay? Um, had any better? Not really? Okay, no, okay, then why, why bother? Okay, let's let at least. Yeah, that's really bad. Hmm. Okay, I have an idea. I'll turn this light off. Worse, right? This can't. Yeah. We're we're planning for the chopper retreat because. I have to go somewhere else to do it from here. And uh, it's because I use a high res camera. Anyway, let's see how it goes today. So um, we have uh, a question or two or three or one from last, uh, from Monday's class. I think we have already discussed them in the end um, of class. I Kind of anyway, ask it again because I was rushing at the end. Okay, I will have to find them, Maharaj. Um, Krista, did you save them? Um, I have a big screen now so I can see all of you with more clarity, which you may not like. I don't know. I think now he can see how much in my eye I am. No, I don't, I don't look like, I don't look for Maya. Today I read something exciting. We were talking in one class, we were talking about how we want to see a person as they are, uh, excuse me, as they can become, not as they are, and how Prabhupada did that. And so I was reading Bhagavad Gita this morning, nine, chapter 9, verse 30. And it's that verse about if someone commits some immoral act or sinful act, if they're remorseful and repentant and determined to be Krishna conscious, we should see them as sadhus. And it was mentioned, this is not in Prabhupada's purport, but it was mentioned in another commentary, that's the vision of seeing someone as what they can become, not as who they are. That was an example of that. Isn't that nice? Yeah. So Bhagavad Gita 930 is an example of seeing, said you should see him as a saint, and you say he's not a saint, and say, well, he will be. <laughs> if he's repentant, he doesn't keep committing this sin, and he's determined, he'll become a saint. So the idea is he's determined to practice and he'll become a saint. That's the idea. Hare Krishna. Okay, so we have a question about, well, even if you can't find the question, you know the question because you told me what it was. Did you find it or should we just I, I go? Sent it. I sent it to the chat, Maharaj. Okay. The questions from Krishna Karshani Mataji. Okay. Oh. I'm sorry for being a bit challenging, but what the sannyasi with beautiful room said sounds for me like justification of fulfilling desire of living in luxury. Well, it wasn't that luxurious. Sannyasi should live simple. Um, yeah. Yeah, Ananda, ask your question also. You have to know. So we told the story about a god brother of mine who 
brought me into his room and his room was quite nice. It wasn't, wasn't that big. It wasn't like, you know, this big, <laughs> big huge room. She had a nice bed, nice furniture, some nice paintings, nice curtains. And it was kind of like his refuge from the storm, you know, come back home, sweet home. So manage, management can be difficult. So um, the way I would look at it is a little bit like, let's say somebody is eating like sabji full of paneer. Instead of chapatis, they're eating puris. And um, on the side, they have pakoras and samosa. Now you're all getting hungry, right? And not just white rice, but uh, spicy rice with peas and a nice nectar drink, not just water. And for dessert, they have shrikan. And you're serving and the person is, you know, very advanced devotee, either sannyasi or a very advanced devotee. And your mind starts thinking, if he's an advanced devotee, why is he eating like this? This is like, to me, this is, I don't eat like this. Brahmacharis don't eat like this. This is sense gratification. He's misusing his position. Right? That's how you could think that way. But... Does he get up for Mangalarti? Yeah. Does he chant his rounds? Yeah. Does he follow the four principles? Yeah. Does he serve 15 hours a day? Yes. Is he inspiring? Is it, are his classes inspiring? Yes, yes, yes. So you have to have some reason to believe that that eating is a problem for him. So we're, we're, we're comparing the eating to the room or whatever it is that person's doing. If it's not sinful, eating like that is not sinful. Having a nice room is not sinful. Maybe a little extravagant if you're a sannyasi, perhaps. But the person eating that way says, as 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 is often heard, quote unquote, well, I have no other sense gratification than eating. So if I don't eat nicely, I might like go crazy. You know, I need something, you know, just to to keep me going, right? I think we can all relate to that, right? Have you ever been in a temple or somewhere where the prasadam is so bad after like five days, you don't know if, you don't know what to do. You start becoming depressed and anxious. I was in that situation actually. Um, I lived in I was in India for at a temple for three weeks. That prasadam was, oh my God, it was too spicy for me and had too much turmeric for me. And everything they cooked had the same spice, so everything tasted the same although the vegetables changed and it had the same spice in the doll. So you go from the doll to the vegetable, it was the same taste. And both of it was too spicy for me and too much turmeric. So after about five days, I actually went crazy. I didn't know what to do. So I started having to make my own meals and this and that. So I'm sure you all have that experience if you've ever been in a situation. Yeah. Are you going crazy right now, Nadia? You can't get any cooked food, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so you know, so she knows, she knows what's happening. So, so someone might say, I just need to get good prasadam because I, you know, I have no sense gratification in my life. I renounced household life. I don't have a house, I don't have kids, I don't have a wife, don't have my own car, don't have this, don't have that, don't have this, don't have that. This is my only sense gratification, right? And it's not causing me to fall down. So that thinking may be there. Better thinking is. Um, I don't need any sense gratification, right? That's better, right? That would be better for a sannyasi, right? But then again, one could say, well, it's not sense gratification because it's prasadam. And I knew this one sannyasi, his rooms, they kind of look like the White House in America. Um, and, you know, where he ate, a beautiful room, but he ate less than everybody and he slept less than everybody. So it's kind of like a contradiction. So that's what I would say, Prabhupada would say, you know, well, look at what he's doing, don't bother him. There was um, another example, maybe not the same. You may have heard this story, Jayananda Prabhu, he works very hard. 
and he doesn't sleep much. And I personally witnessed uh, that he was sleeping four hours a night and basically working. When I was with him, it was Rathiatra time. So he was working from 4 a.m. to 10 p.m. So you can do the math. Uh, that's 18 hours, right? And so that leaves two hours. Well, at least he was gone from 4 a.m. to 10 p.m. So there was some prasadam in there. But that was 18 hours, which leaves two hours for japa and two and four hours for sleep. And so I witnessed that he was doing that. If you sleep four hours, which I've done, even if you sleep five hours, uh, which I have done day after day after day as a young devotee, when you sit down, you, you do this. One, two, three. If you last more than three, you must be like avatar or demigod. You just fall asleep in three seconds. I can attest to this as I've... Um, in the early days, we slept five hours. That was standard. And we all would get in the van to go on Hari Nam Sankirtan. So it was about 22 of us. So we all get in the van, starts it up, count one, two, three, look in the back, everyone's asleep. Right. So Jayananda came to a darshan and he sat down one, two, three and fell asleep. And devotees were trying to wake him up. And Prabhupada said, he's doing more service than all of you. So leave him alone. So, um, Prabhupada would look at the service one did, right? Prabhupada would look at one's service. He wouldn't. And if one wasn't breaking any principles, then generally we didn't see that Prabhupada was worried um, about the so-called sense gratification. I, I would say in the ideal in the ideal world, yes, a sannyasi should live as simply, but you know, after all, they, they give up everything, right? They give up everything, at least give them a nice room, come on. No, they don't deserve a nice room, they're sannyasi. They should be sleeping on the floor on nails if they're actual sannyasi. So what is this nice room? But it's cold in Russia in the winter. They don't need heat, they're sannyasis. The Prabhupada was in Australia um, and the heater was not heating the room. And he said, bring in another heater. It was like too cold. It's, it's unhealthy, right? So um, other times Prabhupada tolerated, it just depends, you know. So that's that's the answer I would give um, to that question. We, we really want to see, you know, um, if there if there are symptoms that having this nice, quote unquote, nice room. It wasn't that nice. I mean, it was nice. Nicer than my room, I'll admit. But, you know, it wasn't like, oh, my God, I walked in and I fainted. I'd never seen such a nice room. It wasn't like that. You know, is that actually helping him or hindering him? And, and according to him, it was helping him. So he needed certain facilities. I think the other thing to understand is, and we've talked about this before, is that we're all different. So we all need different facilities. So like us Americans who are spoiled to the core are not as austere as you Lithuanians, you Ukrainians, you Mexicans, and you Russians. And what else do we have? Well, Croatian. I don't know about Croatians. Are you guys austere? No, I don't think so. Croatians are spoiled like Americans, but the rest of you, maybe not so. You know, maybe you're more austere. At least it seems that uh, from living in Mayapur with all the Russians, it seems like um, they can live more simply. They're used to more simple living, right? Doesn't necessarily mean they're more advanced than you go to the Americans' apartment. Of course, you will say, oh, I've been to Russian apartments, they're really nice. You know, I'm sure that's true also. But my point is that, that that just because one needs a little more comfort or a little less comfort is not an indication that one or the other is more advanced, right? Like uh, take a village Indian, you know, put him in the Brahmacharya ashram. He can sleep in a room that's six feet long and six feet wide with 20 people. And he's like, yeah, this is how I grew up. This is, we love this, sleep on top of one another. It's true. And if you don't put the Indian in the room with 20 people and give him his own room, he'll start crying. I want my own room. I want to be in the room with 20 devotees and sleep on top of them because that's how he grew up. So you think, well, look how renounced he is. 
It's not renounce. That's just how he is. That's just the culture. It was true. I mean, this has been told to me that one devotee said he had like five brothers and sisters and they all slept on one bed, one big bed. And if they were offered another room, they would take that as an insult. <clears throat> in the West, you live with your brother or sister till a certain age, and then you, at least in America, then you get your own room. It would not be considered proper after like puberty. So um, we can't always judge somebody by externals, that what, what they need, right? So, so this devotee says, this is what I need so I can be serving 18 hours a day or 15 hours a day nonstop. Okay, go for it, take it, we give it to you. And that person's service was tremendous and very needed by Prabhupada. So, you know, so that's what we look at. We look at, you know, okay, if that's the result of giving him a nice room, give it to him, right? Um, at the same time, uh, the point Krishna Karshini brings up, I've also thought, but as I said, even that sannyasi thought like that. He he told me, I wish I didn't need a room like this, because this is not really the way a sannyasi should live, but I need it. So even he was thinking like Krishna Karshini. I don't know if Krishna Karshini, you're here listening to my answer to your question, but even he was thinking like you. So that's also, you know, that's also nice introspection. You know, I, I probably probably would rather live more austerely, but this is what I need. So you know, that's honest, right? Within within boundaries, you can't go beyond the boundaries of sannyas, you know, like, well, we'll bring in a woman, you know, for a few hours every night, just, you know, because life is austere. Okay, yeah, all right, that's, call the fire department then, that's a problem. But he was up every morning, early. Yeah, so, yeah, okay. Is that okay? Is that answer okay? Any, if anyone has any doubts or questions about that answer, they can make a comment. It's not meant to justify sense gratification. Um, but Prabhupada did say, you know, choose the ashram that's most suitable to you. So, you know, if you need more sense gratification than is allowed in the sannyas or brahmachari, brahmacharini, Brahmachari, Brahmacharini, Ashram, Ashrama, to be proper Sanskrit, then you have to take the Grahasta Ashrama, because that's the Ashrama where you can upgrade to a higher level of sense gratification without getting arrested, basically. And, you know, if, if a Grahasta is living in luxury, most other people will say, Wow, look at him. He's so successful. Look at how he's like, nobody, everybody will praise him. You know, wow, he's so successful and he's a nice devotee. He's the best of both worlds. Beautiful house, beautiful wife, beautiful kids, beautiful bhakti, beautiful altar, spends his money, you know, put on festivals. Everyone will appreciate it. But if a sannyasi lives too opulently, it won't be appreciated because it's the ashram for renunciation. So if you want to be brahmachari, brahmacharini, Sanyasi, yeah, obviously you have to live appropriately. There are there are limits. Okay. I think you all understand that already, right? Now the problem is, what do you do when you see a sannyasi drive up in a Rolls Royce surrounded by three beautiful young girls with low-cut cholis? Then what do you think? You know those low-cut cholis? You've seen them? Yeah, what I call bikini cholis, and you know, then then it's like, okay, uh, I don't know. Naturally, you're going to be questioning, but in general, you're probably not going to see that. At least in ISKCON, that's that would be rare, right? But naturally, the question will come to mind, and often the best advice is keep your nose out of other people's business, and you know, just worry about your own problems. That's generally the best advice. Um, if there is evidence that there's some problem that someone has transgressed the rules of their ashram and uh, it's inappropriate and it seems to be verified information, yes, of course, that's different. Something will have to be done, whether it's your job, uh, 
or someone else's job, but yeah, then it's then it's different. Okay, Krishna Karshani says, but if two devotees don't match and has very different psychology, Krishna conscious may not help. Uh, we're, we're, we, we should learn communication skills. Most problems between people is based on lack of good communication. So this obviously is in relation to something else. Right? I was thinking about this this morning because I'm going to, uh, there's two devotees who want to speak to me. They're getting married. They want some tips about Krishna consciousness. Uh, marriage. So here's here's a tip for all of you. You have a physical body, obviously. You have an emo you're an emotional, psychological being, obviously, and you are. Well, you carry a, a an emotional, mental, intellectual, and physical body, but you as the soul are different. So we could say, for the sake of this discussion, we'll just say you are a three dimensional being. And you could divide it more into more dimensions. You could divide it into 24 and a half dimensions if you want to be, do Sankhya philosophy. You are an earth being, an air being, an ether being, a fire being, a water being, and you have senses and sense objects. And you have a mind and intelligence. And you were originally, you came from Pradhan. You know, we could do Sankhya, but for the sake of discussion, we'll just say you're a physical, you're a mental and you're a spiritual being. So a lot of devotees, um, more more of the naive, uh, say naive, naive maybe, or just lack knowledge. Think if the spiritual lines up, that's all that matters. It's important for sure, right? But if your natures don't line up, or there's no, there's not some physical chemistry, at least a little bit, at least for Westerners, Westerners need physical chemistry to some some level. But especially the, the, the nature, the gunas, uh, the culture, the background, the level of education, so forth, if it doesn't line up to some degree, then even though it lines up spiritually, it may not be enough because there's three dimensions you want to line up. So you just don't want to make a mistake of lining it up spiritually. Oh, he gives such good classes and such good kirtans, and he's got a tattoo of Lord Nishringa Dev. That's it. I'm down. You know. How many have we seen that that happened to, right? Well, a, a lot, I'm sure. I mean, I mean, I'm not a woman, but I assume that happened. Aside from the tattoo of Lord Nishingadev, it's true. You know, who wouldn't be attracted to someone who's spiritually evolved? But spiritually evolved people also tend, can tend to be quite detached quite renounced, and um, a lot of them have reclusive natures. They like to be alone. A lot of them are very brahminical. They like to study and read and write and be alone. And so you can see where I'm going with this. They may not be ideally suited for a relationship unless they marry another person who likes to be alone. Then they can both be alone, you know, for like 15 hours a day. And they, they could say good morning when they wake up and good night when they go to bed and that happy marriage. And then maybe they do puja together. And that's like, that's all they need. Although I doubt any woman would be happy with that. I know men who would be. Especially if the wife makes money, they would be doubly happy because then they could do their puja and studying all day and not have to work. So um, I think I mentioned to you previously that what seems to be a good quality spiritually could also not necessarily be good unless it's balanced with other material qualities like relationship, like the person is a good communicator, um, doesn't have a big ego, doesn't want to control everything and everybody that he sees, um, is sensitive, um, it's not going to put you down when because you're you're not a pure devotee twenty four seven like that. So sometimes devotees who are very advanced are not like that, and sometimes they are, and sometimes they aren't. So that's you know I don't know what we were talking about before, but um, obviously because you're dealing with different dimensions, it's it's like sometimes. You buy a product and it does many things, and you 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 analyze well. Is it good at it's good at this, but is it good at that? 
And it may not be good at that, but it's good at this. So does the good outweigh the bad? I, or I, I need a product that's good at everything. And so generally, from my experience, women need a product in a man that's good on all three levels. So as I said, jokingly, but with some seriousness, ladies who are not married, beware of the men who are too Krishna conscious. They could be dangerous, uh, if you know what I mean. Right. They may, you know, they're so Krishna conscious, they don't even care about you. They're just like, they're married because they couldn't remain brahmachari, but they're not that into being married. It's possible. Have you seen those types around? Any of you? Have you seen them? They do exist. I was one of them, so I know. I, I've come around, but I was definitely like them. I realize that if I take sannyas, there's a chance I won't make it due to my nature, understanding my nature. I thought, well, it's better I be married. Then I get married and it's like, yeah, you know, can't be a sannyasi, can't be a grahasta. Like, you know, what do I do now? You know, jump off the Golden Gate Bridge. So I had to adapt, understanding, okay, if you're going to be a grihasta, this is what you have to do. So if a man's willing to do that, then he can do it. And so this is what my wife needs. These are my responsibilities. Even though I may not be naturally inclined to do all of that, I need to do it because it's my duty. So that then that's that makes for a good marriage. And ladies, you adapt also. You want a mansion, 25,000 square feet, three Rolls Royces in the garage, you know. And you're like, okay, I have to adjust to that because this is Krishna consciousness and my husband's a simple Brahmin. And if I make him work three jobs, you know, 22 hours a day, that's probably not my best service to him. So you also have to adjust, right? Sometimes it's the other way around, that the man is, is, is who wants everything and the woman doesn't. That's also there. So I don't want to stereotype this, but... Uh, okay. Playing the devil's advocate. All right. So um, the rule is never to sit down nor close your eyes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Unless you've gotten it, like at least seven hours sleep, then you can do it. Some devotees can do it, but it's usually later in their devotional career. Okay. I think Sarada is playing the devil's advocate. Sarada, I just can't imagine you being a devil. But anyway, Vistanyasi is managing and needing to have more opulence to deal with the stress of management. Aren't they perhaps in the wrong ashram? Ooh. I didn't say that. Any She said it. Because it seems that in Vedic culture, the Chaitri Gurhasta are the managers and the sannyasis travel and teach and not to manage. Yeah, that's, that's, it is possible that one in their enthusiasm to take sannyas may not be ideally suited. But uh, the introspective sannyasi will try to understand that and then adopt a more renounced life or in some cases, as we've seen, just decide it's not the ashram for me and get married. And um, did I tell you that story uh, about this, the devotee who went to Nepal? Did I tell you on Monday? He was a sannyasi and he went to Nepal. Did I tell you? I guess not. You don't remember. So Prabhupada gave a devotee uh, sannyas early in the movement. And he knew Sanskrit. He knew Bengali. He knew Hindi. He was helping Prabhupada uh, with Chaitanya Charjamrita and with Nectar of Instruction. This is probably late 90s or, or so, early 70s. And then his passport ran out and he had to go to Nepal to get a passport. And in Nepal at that time, probably 1970, at that time was full of hippies, you know, living it up in Nepal. Um, I would assume hippies, hippies going to Nepal means marijuana, hashish, etc. was all legal. And uh, it was cheap to live. So that's why they would go there, I would assume. So these two sannyasis, you know, were all formerly hippies. So one thing led to another, and pretty soon they got involved in the hippie scene. And uh, free love and intoxication. So they both ended up with girlfriends. 
Two sannyasis with girlfriends, right? Only in Iskon would this happen, right? Maybe not so much today, but you know, you can imagine then, yeah, not not unusual. So he wrote Prabhupada. Oh, so while he was there in Nepal, Nepal is is where you get Shalagram Shila, as far as I remember, the Gandaki River is in Nepal. Can anyone confirm or is that anyway? He got a Shalagram Shila. I must my brain is the Gandaki River, I believe, is in Nepal. That's where you get Shalagram Shilas. So some Baba gave him a Shalagram Shila. So I'm I'm listening to the story and I'm thinking. He's a sannyasi, he's got a girlfriend. This Baba gives him a Shalagram Shila. Prabhupada's gonna write him and say, you are unqualified to worship Shalagram Shila. You, you, know, you fell from sannyasi, you have a girlfriend. Prabhupada says, I'm very happy to hear that you husband and wife are worshiping Shalagram Shila and thank so-and-so Baba for giving you the Shila. I was like completely astonished at Prabhupada's response. And I'm sure you're astonished also, right? Aren't you? You were all thinking the same thing. Prabhupada's going to smash him. Oh, my God. Right. You're a Russian, Eastern European nature was about to brim over, right? That conservative side was just like, he's going to get smashed. Yeah. <laughs> I'm American. I was thinking that way also. But my ancestors are... German, so it, my German side came out. Yeah, kill him. Sanyasi fell down, kill him. That's what I was thinking. And Prabhupada, <laughs> very happy to see that husband and wife are serving together. Hare Krishna. How do you imagine? So, um, and let me explain this to you, because Prabhupada knew that not every young man who took sannyas was going to make it, number one. But I think maybe more importantly is that the old saying, it's not how you start the race, it's how you win. Prabhupada was looking at the long range plan. So what's best for this devotee? Well, if he has a girlfriend, you know, a sannyasi who has a girlfriend, not going to say, leave your girlfriend and come back and be a sannyasi. It's like, obviously, you need to be married. So, okay, be married. That's best. That's what you need. So do that and, and practice Krishna consciousness so that in the long run, you'll be successful. That's how Prabhupada's thinking, right? You tripped and fell. Okay, you were running too fast. Now run a little slower so, so you won't fall. This is, that's all. And then when you're more practiced running and later in your life, you could run faster or you'll, you'll, you'll build it up. So we need, we need to think more like Prabhupada. Now, it's true, Saradi, some sannyasis may realize they're not suited for it, and they'll adapt one way or the other, become more austere or less austere, or just remain in the sannyas ashram, but maybe not ideally not following it as strictly as they should, but they don't want to give it up. You know, one of our one of our devotees that you know, Eka Labya, he plays the trumpet. You know Eka Labya, the brahmachari. Maybe some of you have seen him in Kirtan playing the trumpet. He's American. And um, if you're in Mayapur, wherever you are, and he's around, in Kirtan, he would play the trumpet. He's a musician. He went to... He studied music at the Berkeley School of Music and recording. And it's like, you know, it's a prestigious school, isn't it? Berkeley School of Music. You've heard of it? Have you any any of you heard of it? No, yeah. Well, 50% um, of your life is wasted. You haven't heard of the Berkeley School of Music. Anyway, it's Berkeley and Juilliard are the two, like, Ber Juilliard is like, that's like probably more famous, right? Berkeley is more of a university, Berkeley School of Music. And Juilliard is like the connoisseurs of the connoisseurs of the, the rare talent. It's, it's acting, it's music, like that. Anyway, so he was on the sannyas list and he told me that they told him if he's gonna take sannyas, he has to stop playing the trumpet. It's not appropriate for a sannyasi to play the trumpet. 
So yes, there are certain things that would be considered inappropriate for sannyasi. Harmonium, okay. Trumpet, no, no, someone could say, no, could you explain the difference between a harmonium and a trumpet? I don't really understand. They both, they both play notes. <laughs> they both play scales, you know, because harmonium has been adopted, adapted. We think it's like innocent. I don't know, you know, but anyway, there are some things which are considered inappropriate for sannyasis. So any of you out there who want to take sannyas, be warned. You cannot play a trumpet any longer. What about my electric guitar? Sorry, I'm gonna have to put it on eBay if you want to take sannyas. What about my cam camera's okay? Camera's all right. You can shoot pictures of Rindavan. There, you know, there are limitations, right? Okay. Um, and you're thinking, well, who decides what Shastra is it in? that you can't play a trumpet and you can keep a camera. It isn't. But someone has to make some decision about it. And we have a sannyas ministry. So they and there are sannyasis who run it who will determine, you know, what is appropriate and inappropriate. Um, and as I've often said, sannyas candidates should go in a room full of women because in three seconds, the women can tell if he's, if he's qualified or not. And they have all these sannyasis scratching their head. I don't know. Let's put them on a waiting list for another 28 years. You know, we can't really tell. I guess let's bring in three women. They'll tell you in three seconds. You bring the women and go, oh, tell this guy to get married. Are you kidding me? You know? Isn't it? Women's intuition, you know, that, that, that was a big, <clears throat> big mistake, right? That they don't have women on the senyas. They said have women on the senyas ministry, like, Come on, common sense, right? Okay. <clears throat> As you can understand, my ISKCON is a little different than the ISKCON that we have. And I don't know if everybody would like to join my ISKCON, but anyway, I like it. I think, I think some people would like it and some people wouldn't like it. And obviously the people who like my classes like it and the ones who don't like my class. I would never join Mahatma Prabhu's ISKCON. I wouldn't want to be part of it. Yeah. And that's fine. We, the house is big enough for everyone. It's just a room in Prabhupada's house, not the whole thing, you know. You have your room, I have my room, you know, and we meet in the middle and take prasadam together and have kirtan together. And we go back to our rooms, you know, no problem. Okay. Ananda says, it's so hard to be a balanced devotee in terms of how much service we commit to when we hear about such austerities that your generation of devotees will willingly undergoing brahmacharis and krihasas how to balance service and responsibilities in our time place circumstances and still be enthusiastic dedicated devotee when we have so many prophet disciples as our examples inspiration well i'm going to say something which has to be said and it's not nice yeah so ananda look at the children from that generation and I think that answers your question. Yeah, we were doing austerities and we were serving all day and we also neglected our families. So as your husband told me, there's only 10% of the kids still who are practicing. He said it went down in a little way. It was 20%, it went down to 10%. So that generation of children were neglected by parents who were doing all this austerity. So it was out of balance. Um, here in Alachua, and I'm sure in, in England also, this generation, the generation that I saw, because I moved here, we moved here about 18 years ago, 17 and a half, 18 years ago. So there was a whole generation that I saw growing up. My daughter was two and a half. So I saw this whole generation of her friends growing up, and they're all like amazing, like amazingly stable, well-educated and fired up to preach. Um, and they're all, well, I can't say all, because I only see the ones that I see, but I'm pretty much seeing all the ones that she grew up with, and they're all around, you know, happily engaging. So they all had stable families. They all had families who stayed here, who've been in one place. I grew up in one place for 18 years. That, that was nice. Same friends, same school, same everything. So they all grew up here, you know, the same everything. They all get to go to the school, same school, 
Some of them are teaching at the school they went to. You know, it's like same faces, just they look a lot older now, you know, but the same faces they grew up with, the same community. So it's totally different. So, um, you know, I would say inspiration has to be balanced with responsibility. Because if your inspiration overrides your responsibility, then you get that, that husband who says good morning and good night to his wife, and that's about it. And, uh, and when, the, when the kids are 20, they finally find out that they had a father because they never saw him. Because you know, he was in his office when they went to school. He was still in his office when they went to bed, and you know, they find out 20 years later they actually had a father. So, and he, went, and he was traveling, distributing books most of the other time. So that creates a problem. So um, the problem that we had was how do you balance all these statements about surrender and detachment and give up everything and do whatever Krishna wants and with the fact that you have a family, which seems to be contradictory. Prabhupada never meant it to be contradictory. We just understood it to be contradictory. I have a question. Have I frozen up yet? I don't think I have. No, yeah, it's the low, low res. You don't freeze, but you don't look as beautiful as high res, right? I look kind of fuzzy. Is that it? I'm fuzzed out. What if I put a blurred background? Let's try that. Then in comparison, um, in comparison, I won't look so fuzzy. Let's see how that works. Any better? Still fuzzy. Worse, right? All right. This is a problem. Until I get faster internet, I can't really... I mean, I could use my phone, but then I don't see all of you. I just see little, little, little eyeballs or something. And I have to read the read the comments. It's hard. But the phone also, phone has a better camera, but it's still lower resolution. Anyway, what do do? Kya hai? Okay. So, um, so the, the trick is how the trick is to take that whole idea of renunciation, inspiration, and, and then apply that also to your responsibility. So it's not like one derides the other. You know, well, if I take care of my kids and my family, then I'm just like in total Maya and I have no time for devotional service. Wait a minute, that is devotional service. And you having no time for other service, that's your problem. That's not because you have kids or unless they're, you have triplets or something, yeah. But um, that's, that's for you to work out. But um, so you take that same inspiration, et cetera, et cetera, and then you apply that to your responsibilities. At the same time, you maintain good sadhana. So, so you have to take it that way. And then whatever time you have to engage in outreach, you engage in it with the same inspiration and enthusiasm we had when we were young. So that you're maintaining both. So your family doesn't suffer. At the same time, you don't dry up. So it's, we should all be enthusiastic, but it's a question of where you put your enthusiasm and how you put that enthusiasm. So don't, well, if I can't be, enth if I can't be enthusiastic for preaching because I have you know, so many other responsibilities, then I won't be enthusiastic about anything. No, be enthusiastic about your responsibilities. And devotees expert, do them expertly. That's your devotional service. And then, you know, it's like there was this one teacher who said something really funny about balance. He said, you succeed at one thing. He said, being out of balance is to succeed at one thing by failing at another thing. Okay, so yeah, I spread Krishna consciousness all over the world, and everyone in my family is in total Maya, but I've saved the world. All right, and you know, and, there is some validity to that. If you can actually save the world, it might be worth sacrificing, you know, three or four people. But if you're not, you know, Shaktivish avatar, and et cetera, then you just succeeded at making three people Krishna conscious by losing your family members to Maya. So that doesn't make sense. You succeeded by failing in your family. So that's a really powerful statement. Don't succeed by failing in one area. Don't succeed in one area by failing in another. 
And definitely, definitely, Prabhupada didn't want us to fail at anything. He wanted us to be able to be successful at everything. And so how, how much time you can devote and how much successful you will be, that depends on you. But um, and it depends on your, you know, your family situation and how much help you get. And if you have to work or not work and etc. So it's really important to judge things according to circumstance and who you are. Maybe circumstantially you're you're a mother and you have to work, or you're a single mother and you're working, and you're trying to do sadhana and preach. And like obviously limited. So, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Um, so yes, the other the other point is, as I've said many times. If you were there, Ananda, or if any of any of you were there, and maybe some of you were, and we don't know, maybe you were disciples of Prabhupada. How can we know? It means you died when you're like 50 or 45, and now you're like 25. So you were there, maybe. And if you were there, you were inspired. You were super inspired if you were there to be Krishna conscious. I mean, how could you not be inspired if you saw Prabhupada, right? Like, oh, you disciples, you sacrificed so much. You did so much. Yeah, we all did it, practically without exception, because that's the result of one eleventh of a second, Lava Matra. Sadhu Sangha, Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Shastra Koi, Sadhu Sangha, Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Shri Koi. Um, if you associate with a Sadhu for 11th of a second. That's all you need. I just have to get Prabhupada Darshan for 11th of a second. That's all you need is 11th of a second. That's it. Your material life's finished and you're completely inspired. So, you know, you may have so many, well, I don't know. I'm kind of attached to this. Maybe I should do that. But it's really hard to finish my round. And sometimes I have trouble with this. One eleventh of a second of Prabhupada's Darshan, it's gone finished and you're out the door distributing books that's all it took take one eleventh of a second so you know that's the advantage we had i wish i could just fly into russia or chile or lithuania or mexico and in one eleventh a second you all are like out the door distributing 100 bhagavad Gita's every day but um I know I can inspire you a little bit, but just, you know, if you think I can inspire you, then imagine how inspired you'd be by Prabhupada. Just like you'd be like, yeah, you'd be ready to save the world and make any sacrifice. So we have to understand that also, Ananda. That, that was, you know, a different. It's a different. It was a different situation. It was a unique situation. Um, can we create something similar? Yes and no. We can. We can be inspired. We can distribute books. Devotees are doing it. Can it be exactly the same as when Prabhupada was here? Probably never exactly the same because Prabhupada was one out of, a, I don't know, hundreds of billion of, of living entities, people who... You know. So consider both those things. And I think my first point is very, very important. Yes, we did amazing things, but socially, um, look at the track record of divorce in those days, pretty high. Of children who didn't take up Krishna consciousness, pretty high. People who left, pretty high. So you got to look at the whole picture, Ananda. Because if you just look at one side, then you'll think, you'll, you'll start thinking, I'm so bad. I'm not inspired by, by the Prabhupada disciples. Well, I think maybe we were a little too inspired. You know, there were. You know, they, there were things going on that shouldn't have gone on. So maybe, maybe we need to be a little less inspired, so to speak. Okay, more questions. How do we know that we really need something to be peaceful in KC, or we just rationalize our sense gratification? It seems it's a fine line between those two things. Very good question, and I would just say. Oh, there's two ways. You have to be self. You have to be honest with yourself. To, is this actually helping me? I I see it like eating. You know, it is said when you burp, you should stop eating. Did you know that? 
sometimes I'm eating and I burp and I'm like, oh man, why did I have to burp now? I want to eat more. <laughs> so now it's all guilt after that, right? Because you know you should stop eating. <laughs> Oh, that happened to me the other day. I was eating and I was trying to hold the burp back. I don't want to burp because if I burp, it means I've had enough. So I usually take that as an indication that although my stomach says I need more, my mind says you need more, my tongue says you need more. <laughs> I actually don't. So I have my intelligence saying, you don't need to eat more. I just need a little bit more about dessert. Okay, I have a little dessert, not much. Um, so you have to be a little bit like, you have to know with sense gratification, you have to be conscious of the burp and not to go over the burp, you know, whatever, you know, the size of your house, everything, you know, where's the burp? And, you know, bigger people can eat more, right? They can digest more, right? Isn't it? Prabhupada once said, you know, if you have good digestion, you could eat a stone. So, you know, how much can you actually eat and digest? So, you know, is this good for you? Is it bad for you? Are you wasting time? You know, it's like, let's say you want to write a book and you want to get in the mood. So you think, I'm going to read a book by so-and-so because I want to write in that style. And you're like enthralled in the book, but now you've got the, you've got the style down. You know, it's really, but you just kind of want to read the book now because it's so interesting. And you're like up all night reading and you, you, know, you can't chant your rounds till eight in the morning. Okay, obviously, that's a problem, which you should be aware of, right? The other, um, the other thing is to have people around you who could say, hey, Prabhu, you burped. So just, you know, is enough, you know, put your guitar down, you burped. It's like too much. You've been playing for like six hours. That's like a little too much. You know? So you may sometimes need friends who can tell you when you burped. You're just like, I didn't hear the burp. I know you didn't hear the burp. That's the problem. You didn't hear it. That's why I'm here, because I heard it. And I'm going to tell you, you burped, just like, you know. So having good association is also good to know. And the other problem is, which I think, Nadia, you had this problem. You stopped eating before you burped, right? That was your problem, wasn't it? A little bit? Like too austere? She's thinking, but... I think she was too austere. You want to comment? She's going to write in the chat. Did she write something in the chat? What did she say? I still am. Oh, okay. Yeah, too austere. Okay. Someone invite Nadia over to your house and give her sense gratification. She needs some sense gratification. And if you give her sense gratification, she's going to go, Oh my God, I've been missing this for so many years. Thank you so much for giving this to me. You're making me feel so, I feel so normal now. Yeah, right, right, Nadia? Is that gonna happen, maybe? What's she gonna say? Um, okay, Nadia's not gonna go to Chile. You know how far south Chile is? If you go, any, if you go south of Chile, you have to be a polar bear. Only the polar bears live south of Chile, right, Gabriel? Yeah, yeah. It's like it's like way down there. And if you go to the south of Chile, what the the winter? It's dark, twenty four hours a day. Is that true? Yeah. Well, she's it's the same in Siberia, right? Is it? She's used to it. No. Oh, you, you get some sun in Siberia. I think Siberia is colder in winter, but if you go far enough south in Chile, I heard they have like horrible, horribly cold winds. Is that true? It's really windy down there. Okay. So I have to find where we left off. Okay, we left off on how do we know when we're burping? Okay. You know, uh, okay. I missed a question. I missed Pi's question. How does one know the difference between what we need? Oh, it's the same question. Yeah, it's the same question as Krishna question. Um, this is such an um, interesting point, and I've given a lot of classes by it, 
about it. And I called it the zero point. Like the burp is your zero point. Like so a more advanced devotee gets to the zero point faster because they need less. Right? So two japatis and some kidri and one little piece of burfi. And they're like, they're good for the next like 18 hours. They don't need anything else. So that's their zero point. That's their burp point. But for you, you need a little chutney, a pakora, and you know three chapatis. Okay, so that's your zero point. That's when you burp. But, but in terms of experience, the more renounced person in you, it's the same thing. Because once you get to that point, you burp, and you're both, you're okay now, and now you can just focus on your devotional service. So the point is, what do you need so that you can focus on your devotional service? That's the point, you know? So the sannyasi, he doesn't need anything. He needs his bead bag and you know one change of clothes and a pair of shoes, Bhagavad Gita, a book bag and a sweater and a hat for cold weather. And that's about it. And a spoon and a plate. And if he travels a lot, he probably doesn't need a spoon and a plate. Someone will give it to him. But when we were brahmacharis, when we were asked to move temples or travel, um, we had a lot of empty boxes, which were about this size, and we put everything in a box. So everything we... We needed seriously was in a box. That's that's what it is, a back to Godhead box. And you know, you didn't have much. And you know, you're 20 years old and that's all you have. And you're like, this is this is the life, you know, no responsibility. This is great, you know. And you're happy. You don't want a wife, you don't want kids, you just all you need is a box. And you jump in the van and it's like, this is it. It doesn't get any better than this. Just traveling from one city to another, distributing books, meeting all kinds of people, doing programs. What more could you ask? You're total ecstasy, right? But then when you get older, 25, 26, 27, 28, then you sing another song. I don't know how much longer I can do this. You know, I got all these desires in me and maybe I should go back to school and I always wanted to be a filmmaker. And, you know, I, I'm starting to have this desire to have children. Okay, so the appetite's increasing, all right? So now he has to go back to school, he has to get married, raise kids, etc., before he can burp. And once he burps, he's back in the same state. And now I can just focus on my Krishna consciousness. Does that make sense? So it's just, you know, it's not, even though he needs more, it's not sense gratification. It's just, well, you could call it sense gratification, but I wouldn't really call it sense gratification. It's just what do you need? to be able to do the austerity of getting up early, chanting your rounds, et cetera. So that's what I need, right? You're sitting in a room with, you know, five other devotees and you're trying to go to sleep at nine and somebody comes in at 9.30 and, ball, and it wakes you up and you can't get to sleep till 10.30. And then somebody comes in at 10.30 or they get up, they have to use the bathroom. I slam the bathroom door and you wake up because you're a light sleeper and then can't get to bed till 11. And then somebody gets up at three because they're austere and you can't go back to sleep. So you get up at three. And it's like, how long can you live like that? So, you know, I need my own room. If you need your own room, you have to move outside the temple and get a job. You know? So, so you do that just because you can't live in the temple. So, does that mean you're in Maya? No, it's just this is just what I need so I can, you know, get decent rest and, you know, I I can't live in a room. You know, I was an only child. I can't live in a room with five people. I never saw five people in a house before. There was only three of us. So, um, you can't look at it. You know, just just totally objectively, you know, but on a graph, you have to look at it individually by what is the person doing. So, you know, Ambarish Prabhu, he's like building Mayapur. He's dedicating all his time, all his energy to building Mayapur, you know. It's such a difficult job, uh, such a stressful service, right? And he, of course, as you know, he's from a very wealthy family. So if you go to his house, you go, whoa, whoa nice house and he'll go what's so nice about it you know it's like all my relatives have houses much nicer than this but you know from your perception it's nicer than any house you've ever seen before right so you know it's not you know and you might say oh my god if i lived in this house i'd be in total maya and he's like what are you talking about it's just a house so you know you can't just look at it from your perspective right that's just just what he needs and what his wife needs. And then, you know, his whole life is dedicated to preaching. So you have to look at it like that. 
what do you need? What are you used to? What are your standards? Right? That's what we call the zero, the zero point. So um, a lot of devotees were raised in very wealthy situations. So when they're in nice situations now, which you might think, wow, this is really opulent. They're like, what are you talking about? This is like, you know, this was like half a third, a quarter of what I grew up with. This is nothing. This is austerity for me. But for Anuradha, it's like, oh my God, this is amazing, you know. The poor Mexican girl, you know. <laughs> right? I can make fun with Anuradha. She doesn't care. She laughs. As long as you laugh, Anuradha, and don't throw darts at me, then we're good, yeah. You never know, you know. You make jokes with some disciple, that's it. They'll never talk to you again, so. I don't think Adoram is in that. Anyway, so, but you get the idea, right? Um, so what Prabhupada would look at is like, what are you doing? What's your service? How dedicated you are? Not like how big your car is. He's not, look, he's not looking at that. How many square feet are your, is your home? How many kids do you have? Oh, you have three kids here. Huh? It means you had sex three times. And she probably didn't get pregnant the first time. Though that means you must have had sex like... Hmm, at least 20 times. Oh, this is really bad. Yeah. If you think that way, you need to go to psychiatrists. You need to keep your nose out of other people's business if that's how you're thinking. Because it's, <laughs> that is fanaticism on steroids if you think like that. That's all I can say. Isn't it? You agree? Right. So, and, and the two questions we have. How do we know if what we need is just a rationalization or not? That's the good question. That's what we should be thinking. Okay, I need these. Do I really need it? And if the answer is yes, then just get it and move on. And if the answer is, I don't think I do, then live without it and see what happens. You know, see if you end up killing somebody, then you know, well, I probably should have gotten that, you know. Better get it than kill somebody, right? Of course, we're just making fun here but you know that feeling where you're like oh, you, you know we have a saying in america i'm gonna kill somebody if i don't get this you know you ever have that feeling like you're gonna you're gonna do something wicked if you don't <laughs> i don't know what i'm gonna do but i need to <laughs> that feeling you know if you start feeling like that okay let's give an example from your life the austere brahmachari who knows every brahmacharini's name. He knows her dress size, her hair color, her eye color. Yeah, he needs to get married, like ASAP, right? Now he can, he can try to hold off, but why? What's the point, right? That makes sense? Like, what's the, he needs that. It's like, hello, Prabhu, you know, be honest. This is what you need. So, um, and um, just then, if you need it, you learn how to. You, um, if you need it, then you have to learn how to use it. Um, so now we have a, a little nuance to this question. Alina is asking sense gratification versus a need. Sense gratification will always, um, if it's, well, sense gratification is not bad. Because as Prabhupada said, you have a body and has senses, so it has to be gratified, which means you have to sleep, you have to eat, you have to mate, and some defending sometimes comes up. But he's saying you have a physical body, so, so when we say sense gratification, it's not always a derogatory term, it's just, it's just a reality. You have to gratify your need, certain needs, right, to, be, to live. You have to sleep, you have to eat, mate, defend, you know. Um, when that becomes extravagant, it becomes a problem. When it becomes a need, which doesn't get in the way of your Krishna consciousness, then it's good. And if you minimize that need, then the chances that in the future you'll overdose on that need. You know, like, you ever try to fast? And like by five o'clock, you just like raid the refrigerator and like eat 10 times more than you've ever eaten in your life. That would be an example, right? 
Alina saying, yeah, I do that all the time, every codice. <laughs> oh, Krishna. So, um, I, I think, I think a lot of it is, um, it goes back to, you know, when you're, when you're, when you want to be Krishna conscious, it's, and it's important to you, you kind of, Krishna will just kind of let you know what you need and what's too much when it's gone too far or when it's too little. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, we want to be austere. We want to be renounced. We hear it in every class, but it has to be appropriate. Appropriate renunciation. That's the word. Appropriate renunciation. Yes? So when you hear, you need to be renounced, you need to surrender, et cetera, et cetera, then you have to translate it into what does that mean for me right now today? In this particular state of Krishna consciousness I'm in, in this particular external environment, what does it mean? Now, when you go to Vrindavan on Prakrama and they say surrender, you can go, okay. Now I'm here in Vrindavan, I've got nothing else on my mind, nothing else to do. So surrender is going to look different than when I'm at home with my family, with my studies, with my work, et cetera, and my other needs. And, you know, like for a month, yeah, I can just give up everything, you know, go to Vrindavan with two saris and a sweater and one Bhagavad Gita and a book bag and, you know, one pair of sandals. Yeah, I can do that for a month. Let's do it. Let's, you know, fantastic. But when I get home, what do I need? And if it's less or more, it's not going to be good. And so you're going to have to decide that, figure that out by experience. Is that okay? Alina, did that answer it? Or you, you want me to just tell you exactly what it is? Um, you have to, it goes, you have to have your own meter, you know. It goes, here's the needle. On the one side, it goes need. And the one side, it goes sense gratification. So you put the needle up put the meter up to what you want to do and see, does it go to need or sense gratification? And that will change as you advance because your needs will change. Um, so yes. So what is sense gratification for you may not be sense gratification for her. What is austerity for you may not be austerity for her. So you go, oh, I'm so austere. I got up at five o'clock and another goes, five o'clock, that's so late. What's wrong with you? Right? So for that devotee, three o'clock is like absolute latest. And you, five o'clock is like middle of the night. You know? oh, I got up in the middle of the night, five o'clock. And the other devotee is just laughing. Middle of the night, five o'clock. What time do you normally get up? 11. Oh, okay. For you, it's the middle of the night. But, right? I used to get up at 11 when I was in university. That was like normal. Go to bed at three. Boy, Prabhupada saved me. Phew. What a life. Get up at 11 and get dressed and go to class. And sit there like daydreaming. Okay. Gabriel is a find a husband who knows how to do housework. Yeah. And make a lot of money. And do whatever you say, and you know, got the whole list there. Right? As long as he does whatever I say, makes a lot of money. Great husband. There's some truth to that. Um, of course, we read in Prabhupada's books that the wife should do whatever the husband says. To that, I say, get real, Prabhu. That's not happening. In most cases, at some degree, she will, that's for sure. Uh, but I would say, if you say the, the wife should do whatever the husband says, I would say, and the husband should do whatever the wife says. Make it, you know, let's go 50 50 on this. That's not Vedic, Prabhu. Sorry, but it's real. And I don't even know if that's not Vedic. You know, that's another thing. You know. That's Vedic. You know, the husband is like, he doesn't do anything. 
he's aloof and the wife just serves him like a flight attendant. I don't think that's actually the way it is. Um, uh, Kardama really went overboard to serve Devahuti with that aerial mansion, didn't he? He was whining and dining her for sure. Repay her for all the sacrifice she makes. So, you know, what is Vedic? You know, beware when someone says it's Vedic. Just say, okay, let's, let's, is it really Vedic? It may not be. It just may be what they see as Vedic. You know, you know, here's the problem. I was, oh, I was thinking today how when I was a young devotee, I was very, you know, I went to Mongol RT every day, 365 days a year. Except during a leap year, there's not 365, is there? What happens to leap year? There's one less day or one more. Anyway, I went to Mangalarti every day. Every day, no matter what time I went to sleep, every day, every day, year after year after year after year after year after year after year. And the whole morning program, I didn't miss anything every day. And I was really into Prabhupada's statements about sadhana. You have to do sadhana. And I would preach sadhana. Very, you have to have strict sadhana. I would preach very strictly. And of course, not everybody can live that way. But I wanted everyone to live that way because that's what Prabhupada wanted, especially for temple devotees. And most devotees were living in the temples. And then, as time progressed, we see that so many people are not living in temples and they have jobs, they go to school, they have other responsibilities, they can't be so strict. So I started softening up, so to speak, and becoming more aware of other things Prabhupada said about sadhana. But the point is, at that point when I was you know, very fixed on sadhana, I didn't really notice anything else that Prabhupada said. Like, I only because that's where my mind was. So sometimes you have to realize that you just see in Prabhupada's books what you want to see, because that's what you need to see, and that's what you believe. So that's what you see. So you know this is Vedic because that's what you, you know. Like every guy wants his wife to be a flight attendant, do whatever he says, right? Or most guys do. So that's when he reads Prabhupada's books. That's what he's going to see. He won't see that Kardama, you know, built this aerial mansion and this and that. So, you know, beware of the Vedic way. That's all I can say. We talked today about the situation when Brahmacharya was very happy in KC after he takes sannyas, started to be strongly tested by Maya. And unfortunately, he makes romance with one girl. Question is that through that Maya is stronger than the tested sannyasi. Yeah, well. Is it through that Maya stronger? Yeah, yeah. Well, interesting question. I wouldn't necessarily say Maya is stronger. We would say he's just in the wrong ashram. And if he were in the right ashram, he would have had romance and got married and no one would have batted an eye, right? Right. That same sannyasi falls in love with a female to, well, falls in these days, it could be any, you know, female, male, whatever. So he falls in love, he gets married, it's just totally normal, right? It happens every day. Who would care? Uh, if he was very advanced, we might, we might think, why did he have to get married? He was so advanced. But generally, that's not, that thought's not going to last very long. But because he's a sannyasi, then sannyasi fell down, big problem, right? So if he never got married, no problem, not Maya. Now as a sannyasi, yeah, you have a different standard. So was he in Maya as a sannyasi? Yes. Not as a brahmachari, we wouldn't have considered it Maya. So, you know, that's a way, one way of looking at it, you know, be in the right ashram. So it was just, he wasn't ready for the ashram. That's all. I want to join your ISKCON, Guru Maharaj. I think we already have our ISKCON, yeah. We were talking about this recently with some devotees, how you know, Prabhupada built a house in which the whole world can live, and there just needs to be different rooms in the house. So definitely, we'll have our own room. I don't, you know, I wouldn't call, I wouldn't call what I'm preaching liberal. I would just, I would rather refer to it as balanced, because I don't think I'm just liberal, and I don't think I'm that liberal. I, I, 
I see it more as just making facility. I see it as just being realistic, not like liberal, just being realistic. And then appreciating tradition, appreciating the strictness. As you know, if you've heard my classes, sometimes if you listen to some of my classes, they're kind of heavy. You know, like surrender, sadhana, japa, if you want to go back to Godhead, stop making offenses to all you know. So, you know, I think that that the healthy way to, to understand Krishna consciousness and teach it is to balance both sides of compassion, acceptance, strictness. I think that's, that's just common sense, right? You have to have both. I mean, I was thinking about some classes I gave last year. And after I gave the class, I was thinking, wow, that one was heavy. I was, you know, not a heavy person, but what I said was actually heavy. Was like, oh, you know, like really like, Somebody would say something like I sometimes Krishna Karshani would say something. And then I, you know, it was kind of like floating out here, and I just go, and I just bring it to a point. It's like, oh, like a hurricane. How could he say that? It's so, it's so, you know, she's trying to be like, but some people like this and that, and you have to be real and this and that. And I just go, and I go, no, it's like this. So um, sometimes you have to be straight and narrow, and sometimes you have to be very accommodating and realistic. Not something, I always have to be realistic and accommodating, but you, you combine both. So that's my room. We'll call it the balance room. I, I, would I would like to think, I would like to think I'm like that. I try to be, but you could, uh, you, could try, uh, you could try connecting from two devices. I was thinking of that. One for camera mic. And the other one to look at and read comments. Yeah, I was thinking of that. I could have my phone right here so I wouldn't look so fuzzy. But I don't know if my phone's any less fuzzy. And I can have my computer and see you all. I have a big screen now. I could actually see you. You all look so blissful. Especially when I tell jokes. You look really blissful. Um, Brilliant. Don't succeed in preaching by failing in family responsibilities. Yeah, that's it. Put that on the wall, Ananda. Nova Matra Sada Sangha Sarva Siddhi Hoi. That's the verse. Uh, our Indian cultures say it's compliment to the cook who cook prasadam. Oh, if you eat too much. Yeah, right. And therefore, when we go to your house, Nidhi, you'll try to make us eat too much. Because... You're a real Indian if you do that. Oh, it's a compliment when we burp. Yeah. Okay. Well, when I go to your house, Nidhi, I'll make sure I burp really loudly. Just to make a compliment. In the West, we would think that's quite impolite, right? Just see the difference in cultures, right? Indians appreciate burps and Westerners are embarrassed when you burp. Okay. Uh, come to Mexico. Yeah, we're planning sooner or later. Coming to Mexico, just I just jump over the border. I'm in Mexico. It's just right down the street. No problem. I'll skateboard into Mexico. Well, have to cross an ocean. That's a problem, right? Do they have skateboards that float? Oh, yeah, surfboards. Okay, I'll paddle to Mexico. Won't need a visa then. That's cool. Okay. I have practically nothing, no apartment. No job, no car, no money, no nice prasadam, no nice clothes, no nice kirtans, no dancing. So yeah, kind of austere. Yeah, okay. Can someone invite Nadia to move in with them and, and douse her with sense gratification? Can you go to Lithuania, Nadia? Christy is inviting you into the temple there. You can share a room with her. She'll cook for you. Let's get Nadia Sanyasa ready in our ISKCON. It works. Wow. You want to take sannyas, Nani? You'll be the first female sannyasi, and I'll get kicked out of the movement for giving you sannyas. She's ready. I already is a sannyasi. Tomorrow, Friday in class, we're going to see her in a saffron sari. Um, Berkeley has some great free online courses on music. Well, yeah, one on music. Yeah, I know. I've, I've checked those. I think I actually took one once. That's nice. A lot of these. A lot of colleges now have free online courses. You just don't get credit for them because you don't pay, but they actually, it's the same course. 
Um, Tanya says, recently I read this in Srila Bhakti no Thakur's Bhajan Rahasya. Quote, the person with wisdom concerning material objects accepts as much as is necessary for maintenance of bhakti. By accepting more or less than that, the person will fail to attain its highest goal. Okay, I think... Um, I think, um, yeah, that's what I said, right? Okay, now I have to say something about that. This is not to glorify myself at all, because obviously I said what Bhaktivinoda Thakur said. Um, he's not saying what I'm saying. I'm saying what he's saying. But And I've read this book, but I don't right, right now recollect reading this point. But I have a realization, and I want to tell a story. And this is kind of the introduction to the Japa session, this story. I don't know if I told this, I maybe told this in the last Japa session. A, a devotee asked Prabhupada, will you give me Siddha Pranali? Will you like tell me my relationship? And Prabhupada said, I could. And if I don't, then it'll be revealed. And sometimes Prabhupada would say, revealed by the holy name. You chant the holy name will reveal it, right? Have you ever read something in a book, a Vaishnava book, Prabhupada's book, something that you already realized in, in almost word for word, they're saying what you realize. Have you ever had that experience? It's a beautiful experience, isn't it? And I think by reading what Bhaktivinoda Thakur said, it's pretty much what I said, if not exactly. So I'm so encouraged when this happens because it confirms that the holy name reveals it's the life and soul of transcendental knowledge. It reveals the truth. And sometimes you get this realization, and who are you? It's just some, you know, we feel like we're just some ordinary devotee. And then we're reading Bhakti Nath Thakur, and you're thinking, yeah, but that's what I just realized. So you're having realizations like Bhakti Nath Thakur. Is that true? Well, you don't have his highest realizations, but you have, you know, this one. That's very encouraging. And that shows how everything becomes revealed by the holy name. It's that what so much of, of what needs to be realized is realized through chanting. Of course, you can have knowledge, jnanam, but that's this head knowledge. Big jnanam is realization. You'll get so much realization by chanting properly. So I don't think we can ever overstress the importance of good chanting because it reveals so much of what we need to know. And you know, you see a lot of these things that I'm talking about, right? They're just, you know, they're just revel revelations that come when you practice Krishna consciousness. And then you go in the books and you read the same thing. And just recently, someone sent me a quote. Prabhupada said, if you don't chant properly, it'll take a very long time to be Krishna conscious. If you chant properly, it'll happen very soon. Yeah, go to my Japa retreat. Isn't that what I said? Right, exactly. So both by reading Prabhupada's books and by chanting, you end up basically saying exactly what Prabhupada says, whether you read it or not. That's what it means to be a disciple. So that's that's super encouraging, isn't it? Okay, we actually ended class. We are going to build a house in which the whole world can live. Um, you know, if any. If anyone ever asked me, well, what is your most important instruction? I'd say, that's it. You know, build a house in which the whole world can live. That is our service to Prabhupada. And to do that, you have to be very empathic. You have to have collaboration skills. You have to be, you can't be prejudiced, judgmental. You can't be a bully, a siddhanta bully. You can't throw shlokas at someone and try to kill them kill their ideas. You have to be very open and balanced, right? So your service, ladies and gentlemen, is to build a house, to help Prabhupada build a house in which the whole world can live. Correct? Correcto? Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.